have. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Public Works Finance Committee meeting for October 9th, 2017. On my right is uh, Walter Steed, and my left, Gina Terusio, and um, Jen Piffner sitting in for the uh, absent Gary Reedner today. And um, we'll get the meeting underway here with the first item on the agenda, which is approval of the Public Works Finance Committee meet, uh, minutes from uh, September 25th. Everybody cool with those minutes? I'm good with them. Okay. okay. We'll assume that we had a unanimous eye on that. Uh, second thing on the agenda today is the disbursement report for September 2017. And uh, Sarah Banks is going to run through the numbers. And I notice we spent about $3 million, so we yep, should probably was, talk about yep, that. It was a big month. For September, we spent about $3,609,209. <clears throat> Our major expenditure was payroll coming in at $1,460,527. We had a couple other major expenditures for our Southwest Trunk Line Phase 5. Our fourth payment came in in the amount of $365,008. We, for our booster station Phase 1, we paid out $359,965. And for our slurry sill project, we paid out $217,409. So those were probably the three largest payments. And other than that, it's standard contracts. Okay. I didn't see anything with extra zeros on it. Do you, Mr. Steed? I have no questions. Okay. I guess we would. Uh, we can go ahead and sign the yep. disbursement report. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. signs that we'll move along to item number three which is kind of the star of the show today um, the fiscal year 2017 tiger grant application and uh, Elisa Anderson is going to tell us all the details on that and hopefully we'll get 25 million dollars from this I anticipated less to join me but he must be running late so um, I think in your packet you had the budget, which was which was the numbers that you were waiting for um, for us to propose to you. So I'll just do a little bit of a review, and then we'll we'll talk more about the financial details of the package. Um, as we presented to City Council last week, this is an application that we had previously submitted in um, 2016 and we received positive feedback from the US Department of Transportation when we um, requested a debriefing they asked us to please reapply um, we happen to just be in the um, wrong geographic location to be funded they were making sure last year that at least every state or territory or region, region that they um, that were eligible to apply for um, had been awarded funding and as you know Moscow had been awarded back in I think it was 2009 for a Tiger II so um, so we've redrafted the application um, as we also discussed during council last week um, the third street bridge has been removed from the package and also um, some of the projects that we completed um, over the last two years, which include the improvements on D Street and um, the ball fields project, improvements to the pathway system there, those types of things. We had previously anticipated using those as um, match in our prior application, so we've removed those numbers and we re revamped it with um, what our current projects are. And um, we um, have updated some of the, the other data as far as statistics and demographic information. But other than that, the application largely remains the same. Um, and Les is here now, and I will let him go ahead and go over the actual budget and the components and the city fund sources with you. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Les. Yeah, within your packet, that that last page is just a kind of a, an overview summary of the the anticipated costs uh, that uh, we've included within the application to this point. Uh, overall, looking at a, a total project cost uh, related to the Tiger 
project itself, if you will. So this number does not include any of those ancillary projects that may be in the corridor, but just the, the improvements for which we'd be applying for funding uh, would be in that $20 million figure that you see there near the top. Uh, of that, we're looking for about $17.4 in Tiger Grant funds, with local match then making up the remainder of about $2.6 million. Uh, within that 2.6 million, there's an assumption of a certain amount of value associated with the traffic signal at Mountain View and State Highway 8. Uh, with escalation costs, uh, you can see it there listed as ITD funds for State Highway Signal at 342,000. That assumes that the warrants would be met on the highway as ITD needs uh, to be able to then install, fund and install a signal uh, at that time. Um, so there is a bit of an assumption there that, that we'll actually meet those warrants by 2023 or 2024. If not, then that signal would potentially fall out of the project at that point, as would that funding. Uh, the do you know when they last checked that intersection for warrants? I do not. Okay. I don't know that have, they have. Have they been? I, you know, they have counts periodically, uh, annual, semi-annual type counts that, that are taken throughout the city on the highway system, but I don't know if they've had any reason to actually run the numbers on the warrant analysis. Uh, the remainder of the, the local match then would be city money, uh, 2.3 million, and the um, projected source of those are shown in that bottom section um, with a portion of it coming from the sewer capital, a portion from water capital, and a portion from streets. The reason uh, water and sewer are involved is that the project does include the installation of new water and sewer lines from essentially F Street all the way out to Mountain View Park. So that's a pretty large uh, component of the project up on that north end. So that uh, puts the utilities in there roughly 1.7 million out of that 2.3 remaining local match. So the good thing is that it does bring the demand down uh, in terms of the, the streets or capital projects fund portion of it. Um, previously when we went through this we had a higher number on the streets uh, side uh, so fortunately things have uh, improved a little bit in that scenario. But generally that would be the, the overall funding layout. Uh, you can see the cost share percentages on the right hand side column. Uh, the Tiger Grant would be roughly 87 percent with local funds in the range of 13 percent. That is a similar level of grant to local match uh, percentage that we had the first time when we applied in 2016. And that seemed to work well. Last last time we talked about this, uh, Mr. Steed brought up the possibility that we could use the Third Street Bridge project as match. Is that well, a possibility it's, still? Well, it's, it's within the overall corridor, and so potentially it could be considered as part of the match. Um, we are, we're looking at it a couple different ways uh, as to whether or not it's appropriate to do so or, or if it's needed to do so in terms of benefit. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's there, uh, just like uh, the other projects were in the corridor would be looked at in terms of general benefit and overall local match. But the numbers that are here would not address anything related to the Third Street Bridge at all. Okay, Mr. Steed. What uh, contingency percentage have you got on your cost estimate? The estimates are based on 2016 dollars, but they have been updated a little bit. Uh, then on top of that is a 15% uh, contingency 15, number okay. uh, with a 15% uh, engineering construction administration number. Then that total is escalated at 4% a year from 2016 through 2023. So it's about a 31% increase overall in that seven year span. One more. This is a $25 million maximum grant, is that correct? Yes. And we're asking for 17.4? Yes. <laughs> In the application, we have the project broken down into groups or sections. Um, and last time we submitted, we um, omitted, well, not omitted, we submitted an option where the improvements from F Street on Mountain View around to the park were not part of the project. Um, there's also different groups of funding sources, I mean, funding elements that we have, and we're presenting it to them. So they do have the ability to um, say we can only give you this much. Um, in the benefit cost analysis, which we'll see the drafts on that, I anticipate on Wednesday they'll have run different scenario numbers for us to include in the package. But we will give them some options um, that they can choose from to not fund the entire package if so. I, 
Uh, yeah, I don't know that you understood my question. I didn't make it. Going the other way. Well, no, <laughs> He's going the other way. Let's know where I am. I, know you're going. Sorry, know where I, am. The, the, I think the, the answer here is that there's it's a bit of a balancing act because on the one hand, yes, we could pursue a higher uh, amount of grant funding for the project, either bumping the percentage of grant versus local match, or if you held the percentage, um, well, a couple options. If you increase the, the percentage of grant versus local match, we may not score as well. It also then puts a higher burden on the cost-benefit analysis to show that there's a benefit received for that amount of federal dollars. Okay? And so within the cost-benefit analysis, the more you ask for, um, it, it, it's harder to then show that the benefit is there to compensate or to, you know, to, uh, in response to that requested funding. If we increase the local match, that just puts that much more pressure on us to come up with that money within our system, particularly within the street system, if that's what we're asking for. So yeah, there's there's a Jim, number. Jim of just variables gave you six hundred thousand a match. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, um, it still becomes a question, really, of what can we overall fund and what does the cost benefit analysis tell us in terms of benefit received from the improvements proposed so you're, you're playing an expected value game here where you're yes putting assigning probabilities of getting a certain amount versus what you could get well, and, and the federal dollars you always have to show that there's sufficient return benefit for the amount of investment that the feds are making and so you, know, you don't want to be too close on that because you know if you're running at one one and a half you know one point two benefit to cost that, that's pretty tight yeah you know, if you're running two or three times the benefit value versus the cost base, then they look on that more favorably. So that's, we're trying to make sure we're keeping that, that ratio as high as we can on the positive side. So now that I've triggered into what you were asking, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were saying, is this too high? Um, actually, I have, there's been several webinars that I've participated in and watched, and um, the, the key things that they say is that, um, however, you know, we aren't requiring the rural communities to provide match, but in order to be competitive, and those are the key words that they use, um, they encourage you to have match and they encourage you to have project partners and to be able to spread the benefit across the board and, and the expenses. And part of what we're considering is how well we did in the first round uh, mm -hmm. on this project last time and trying to mimic uh, that, you know, that type of an application and, and certainly the you know, the match ratios, uh, we are doing that. And so we think that would be, that was part of the reason that we ranked as well as we did. My understanding is that the way that's broken down, as it was shown on the map with the, the various sections, different groups. sections, and that they could select any or all of those to fund based on what the cost-benefit ratio was and what our match was and all those all the factors that they might put into it if they if it came down to this region and they only had so many so many dollars they could select the thing with the highest cost-benefit ratio and award us that and leave us out on the rest yeah, of them. I, I don't know that they would go to that detail uh, that level of de detail because they wouldn't necessarily have all the information to make that kind of a determination but more likely they would say you know you've asked for 17 we can't give you that much we can give you 10 or 12. And then it's up to what, us to what allocate. Yeah, how would you modify your project scope mm -hmm. to then work within that budget and still receive the benefit as, as shown through the, the CBA? So I, I, that's the kind of thing that I think generally they would come back to us and say, you know, we can give you this much. Can you make that work in some fashion? And, and that's what Lisa was referring to last year. Um, we looked at it and said, all right, if we can't get the full amount that we're asking for and we had to scale back, which they asked us for options, one option would be to take out that northern piece. Well, right now, if we did that this year, that's about $10 million worth because that's a long stretch with all the utilities in it. Uh, and so the advantage of that is you bring the cost down you know, roughly half. Um, a lot of the benefits are still there, but maybe not fully realized as you would be with the full project. One of the downsides is then our local match availability is somewhat more challenged because now we don't have water and sewer in the picture. So our funding capabilities are a little different. They also require that you do certain things prior to obligation, and much of our match is um, those functions, which are the preliminary design and the environmental and the right-of-ways. So, Actually, um, all, all of the local all of match. That, yeah, uh, are those what, preliminary Yeah, the, the way we distributed this is the we said that we would do right-of-way acquisition, uh, environmental work, and preliminary design, and those expenses would make up our local match. 
Okay. And those are the things Final that they say construction would be under arrest. that you have to you have to finalize those things and in order to get the final obligation. So basically, if if you are chosen, um, if your project is chosen, then the secretary makes their announcement, and that per se is your award. However, it's a long road between there and obligation, and it's it's <coughs> the similar steps that we went through with the. Um, with the Intermodal Transit Center, we had to we had to finalize the transaction with the university on the property. We had to finalize the environmental. Um, they did, however, let us <coughs> finalize the design during the construction or during the obligation process. But there can be, you know, a period of a year or two before you receive that final agreement. Um, so those are the items that we've included in the match and. Um, it's just a, it's watching everything that um, and listening to everything that they've presented to us in the webinars and um, going back over the questions and answers. I've reviewed all of those and looked back at them. So it's, it's um, you know, based upon our resources, this is the best package we can put together. And, and the LTAC funding for Joseph to Six is not usable as a match. It is other um, federal funding. Other federal funding, so can't match federal with federal. Correct. Okay, right. and and that money is not within these numbers that you see here. However, it is in a spreadsheet that will list that shows the other um, funding sources of projects within the corridor. Right. Okay. What's the timing? Oh, do you have something? To do? Go ahead. Why do they make you list those? Um, it shows what other resources you've put into this entire project um, that you haven't just been applying to the Tiger program oh, for funding. Okay. You so know, we've been working on applications f to fund the Mountain View Corridor for several years, right. over 10 years now. And so we've been able to get the, the STP Urban from LTAC to fund a portion of it. We also have some other um, things. We have a bus shelter and some um, bike pedestrian amenities that we'll be funding. Um, so that shows that the, you know, the expenses of the total project are not just relied upon by the Tiger Grant. And that's, that's really something they drill in on is do not come to us for total project costs. The other, the other aspect is the funding agencies often like to see a completion of a corridor, yeah. and that tends to rate a little better. So if we can show that, hey, we've already gone out and done the legwork and received grant monies for this portion of the corridor, and we've done these other pieces in the past, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is complete all the remaining portions like with that. this application. Mm -hmm. Have you been out and measured any bridges yet? No, not yet. <laughs> I just, there's something in the back of my head about one of them, and I don't know which one. Tyler, got a tape? <laughs> Certainly. Come up and ask a question. So, when I was reading over the information mm -hmm. to apply for the grant, I was just curious because the light um, is going to cross over to the bike path. Mm -hmm. Can that be considered in the corridor? Because that complete, that's the whole reason for the bike pass, because it takes it across the street. Do you mean the, the traffic signal? The traffic signal? Yes, yeah, so it is the it traffic is, signal at, at State 8 Mountain View is within this project. I know, but th there's no mention of the Leitah Trail, and I wondered if, if that, if you can or if that's worth in the narrative, we do talk about the other connections. Um, I know of I read it, I didn't see it named. Um, in the prior application? Yeah. Oh, in my in my write up that we included the other day. Oh, no, our narrative is thirty pages long, mm -hmm. and it does talk about the connections that all of the other. Um, so that'll count, like for us. It'll be yeah, it's it's yes. part of the overall network uh, mm -hmm. for the multimodal access network. within the corridor. Mm -hmm. so and then I wonder, does it matter what the property or the zoning is on the land that's connected to where your the funding is being requested? Does that make a difference? No. No, it's, a, it's an infrastructure improvement. They're really not looking necessarily at land uses. There is a, a little with respect to um, economic development. Yeah. You know, if, if the project can facilitate some economic development within a region, then that you might pick up some points there. 
We do talk about Alturas in there, mm -hmm. and we also talk about um, farm to market and um, statistics regarding um, vendors and farmers that come from that east side of town toward um, the market and using that route, those types of things. So we've, we've tried to gather every aspect of mm -hmm. um, different items that, um, you know, people traveling that corridor to mm -hmm. get to wherever they're going. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. So the, the timing of the, um, when do you expect the, an answer on this? They had told us early, late spring, early summer, 2018. Wow. Okay. Yes. I realize I got the cart ahead of the horse because we haven't approved the submission of it yet, but. Correct. Yeah, and if, if, if we are successful uh, and we get that notice in late spring, early summer, uh, we're going to have a very, very busy couple of years uh, to get to the point of obligation. And so that'll be an interesting process that will uh, take a fair bit of our staff time. It's 2023 is when, or 25. When the, is, the obligation when is fall of 2020, and then we have to have the last of the funds expended by the fall of 2025. So we're like. anticipating construction in the 23 and 24 time frame, somewhere in there. Okay. And that also coincides with um, where the LTAC STP urban project is on the state um, transportation plan at this point. Um, yeah, they have given us a year. Previously, mm -hmm. that project was out there in project development, didn't have a year attached to it. In the current uh, statewide transportation plan, it's a 23 or 24. It would match up very nicely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you you would. think you like driving around Moscow this past summer where they tear up all the mountains? <laughs> um, so as Les said, you know, we have all of those pre-obligation aspects of the project that we would need to complete by September of 2020. Okay. Well, I personally see no reason why we can't recommend a submittal of this Tiger Grant. Anybody else object to that I proposal? Have, I have no problem, and I presume it needs to go to council agenda for confirm. Oh, would sure y'all call it confirmation? Ratification. Ratification, because it's got to go in before the next council meeting. Yes, I believe the due date's actually the 16th, but we'd like to submit it a few days early just to bar any technical difficulties or anything that may come up. Ratification yeah. on Monday. Don't get it let, get lost. It's happened to me before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, grants.gov has, um, um, you just don't want to wait to the last minute. Let me put it that way. Yeah. When everybody else is trying to get in the door at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very stressful if you do. <laughs> And when you just see your computer sitting there spinning and you have no control over it, you really don't want to put yourself in that position. So I'd like to have those confirmation emails back. You get three of them. Before the deadline. Yes, it states uh, that they've received your application, that they've downloaded your application, and then that the agency that is reviewing your application has received it. So those are the three, uh, three emails that I want to see pop into my box. And then... I'll be really excited to see um, one coming, I would like to say, in April that says, you have, <laughs> not we are sorry. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Thank you very thank much. You. For thank you. Thanks, guys. Going over the entire presentation again, and I'm sure you'll have to do it again. But <laughs> thank you. Okay. So now we're down to reports. Anybody, you have some reports? Well, a question, if I oh, might. Certainly. Did you, want, did you want this to go to consent? Could it? Should it? I don't know. Well, I think it could. It could. It was already been presented to council okay. last time, go, so, so I don't see why it can't go to consent. Okay. Yeah. So we got a water conservation program update Ooh. from Nicole Baker and Tommy. Sh I mean Tyler Palm. <laughs> <laughs> Good Thank day. you, councilors. We're really, really excited to be here. This is. Uh, one of the more fun reports I think I've looked at in a while. This is this is really exciting. This is our our uh, water conservation update. As you'll recall, we've uh, passed a comprehensive water conservation plan that Ms. Nicole spent a lot of years drafting and working up for the city of Moscow. We've, we're really proud that that was drafted in house. Something that we spent a lot of staff time. A lot of cities will hire that out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars putting that together. But we did it in house and got it drafted largely because of almost entirely because of Nicole here <laughs> and. Uh, 
we've seen some really exciting successes. And so, uh, you know, you'll, you'll recall that just a couple weeks ago, uh, I was here talking about the water alternative supply study at a council meeting um, and how critical water is. I mean, it's just absolutely imperative. We have to have it to live where we want to live and to do what we want to do. And so it's the just most fundamental component of, of any human civilization. And, and water here on the Palouse is something that we can't take for granted. And so we really want to shift the narrative about how we think about water. And that's largely what our conservation program tries to do is encourage our residents to think about how we're using water to see it as a resource rather than a free thing that comes into the tap and a throwaway thing that goes down the drain. And that's, that's really our goal is to think of it as a resource and something that does cost us to produce, cost us to treat, and then to redistribute. And so we're going to talk a little bit today about what we've seen happen since we kicked the program off. And so we're super excited. I'm going to let Nicole do the bulk right. of this. We're going to take turns here. So um, I spoke with you all in February of this year, and I just wanted to do a brief recap of what our fixture rebate program is about. Um, just for anybody that is interested in our community, we have a toilet rebate program that was approved by council in February of 2016, and it was implemented by May of that year. So we are looking at single family, multifamily, and commercial customers can um, take the opportunity to switch out those old um, fixtures and replace them with an upgrade of a high efficiency or a code toilet, code toilet being 1.6 gallons per flush, high efficiency 1.28 or better. Um, we accept do-it-yourself installations as well as from professionals. And I did, I do have a little, um, a picture of one of our rebates that was um, um, submitted and you can see this old toilet versus the new toilet and how much one household can um, save annually with just switching out one toilet. So um, just one household can make quite a bit of a difference. What's that number? 16,000 16, 16, gallons. Thing. Okay, so then I'm going to look at a citywide um, response to our fixture rebate program. Uh, we are comparing fiscal year 2016 to 2017, and then we have the grand total because, of course, with a water conservation plan, we do look and consider full implementation values because once these toilets are switched out, we see that savings um, every year from there on out. So you can see from the fixture rebate participation, it has increased significantly. Now, I will add that um, although it was approved in February of 2016, the implementation, we started receiving rebates in May. So fiscal year 2016 is not a full um, year compared to um, 2017. However, we still saw an increase even if we just look at that time frame. Um, you will see the total water savings from this program is at 1.4 million gallons annually. And um, of course that will be compounded over the years with this water conservation plan that the city and the um, council has um, supported. Now, One of the important things to note within that is like when we pass a program as a city and we say, hey, we want to do this, that there's a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes to make that happen. You know, you think about, okay, we've got a conservation plan now, but then we look, okay, how do we implement this? We've got to write applications. We have to have a process by which people can access those. They have to be online. We have to have a process by which we assure that it happened and that we actually get the check over, get, get an indication over to finance that someone needs to be cut a check, and then finance needs to know what to do with it. And all of these interactions need to be set up and happen. And so we're really happy with our environmental services staff because they, they really pretty rapidly implemented this program and figured out all those steps and usually you run into some hiccup but when we have a program especially one that the public interacts with so directly it's really important for us that it be a smooth implementation because a lot of times they'll judge that program based on that initial interaction with the program and if it's a real pain to deal with you know they don't go tell their neighbor hey change out your toilet it was really easy it was cool to deal with this this is simple and I got a check if it was I spent months trying to deal with the city I had to recall and you know I had to remind them and the application was really long and hard that stuff really impacts it. And so I was really happy with the work that they did to make a very smooth, it's, it's a really easy, understandable program, and people have responded well to it. I, I should add a thank you to the finance department. They're a part of this process. And I would say our turnaround time is when an application is for fixture rebate, I receive it. It's within two weeks where they receive a check. So it's sometimes quicker than that. If I may, the 17138 total cost, is that checks written? That's checks written, 17000 That's not capturing any of your time or anybody correct. else. Correct, correct. It's, it's checks written. Correct. That, that's, there's no administrative time okay. included in that. That is, yeah, that's cash out the door. 
Okay, and if I may, um, cost per 1,000 gallons saved a dollar fifty nine. Is there any way to, to tell us what we charge to sell a thousand gallons? Um, yes, mm -hmm. we do have. So if when we, somebody when somebody runs a thousand through a meter, yes, what is it? What is it? Cost if we're looking at flow um, rate costs for production and for treatment. Um, that comes to 36 cents for water treatment for potable, and it is 43 cents for I think water what, reclamation what, what and reuse. Asked is, is, what is, if on my bill, how much does a thousand gallons cost me? I know, we, and I know we've got a sliding scale, so it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to answer. But is there? Well, yeah, we can feet, yeah, we can, so can figure that out. Yeah, we can certainly give you that. Yeah, it would be an interesting number to include in the presentation. Yeah. We yeah, because that. that goes back to some questions that were raised back when this program was presented, uh, looking at the cost of conservation, and we've yet to develop the answers to those questions. So that just kind of reminded me of it. And, and what Nicole is hitting on is that we, we've some of the questions that come up is we have a cost of production, just a basic cost of production. What does it cost to produce that? What are the electrical costs, the the pumps, the maintenance, and then what does it cost to treat it at our wastewater treatment plant? And so that's with this, the second number of the 80 cents with the comprehensive cost per 1,000 gallons, that incorporates those numbers. So it shows the additional savings for water that we're no longer having to produce Process. and water that we're no longer having to treat. Um, it, there's, there's not a, a direct correlation as far as a, a decrease in the numbers and the budgets for those because there are cer there's certain infrastructure that we just have to have no matter how much volume we're putting out. So it's not like I can say, oh, now I'm going to have a smaller well because I'm pumping less. We've got existing infrastructure. We have a certain amount that we I, – I can't, I can't say I'm going to fire a water production operator and go from two to three because now I'm producing X number of gallons versus Y number of gallons at the treatment plant. Um, there's just an inherent cost of certain things, so it's not directly apples to apples, but this really, that number gets pretty close to capturing that. So, if I may again, uh, Tyler, we're writing a check for $1.59 per thousand gallons saved, but we're not spending 80 cents to pump it out of the ground and put it back into the creek. Correct. Okay. So we've got a net of 79 cents out of pocket to the, of the city. Yeah, I think that's, yep. It's accurate. So, so you're adding in uh, the wastewater treatment plant at, at the same rate that it's pumped, as though 100 percent of it. No, what, what, what we look at is what we what we look at is what plant. our costs are at the plant for treating a thousand gallons, and so this is in that goes in the clean side, right? So, so we look at coming in the dirty side to to take to take a thousand gallons from the dirty side and to get it out the clean side. What does that cost us? No, I'm I'm talking about. What comes out of the ground and goes in as potable, drinkable water, the cost of producing that, and then yes. a certain percentage of that goes to the treatment plant and a certain percentage doesn't. Right. Right? Y yes. So, yeah, so, so this does account for that. This, this accounts for the calculations for what's actually indoor use versus which would be going to the sewer versus what might be put on a lawn. Yes. And, yep, that's accounted for in that number, yep. And, and it's a pure cost number. You're, you've got two different numbers. Your production number was... Um, for potable water treatment, 36 cents, and that's, again, based on a flow. Is that production or treatment? That's pr Both. production. Now, treating the, at the water reclamation reuse facility, that's 43 cents. So 36 cents to get it out of the ground, get it treated, put it in our lines to your home for your tap, for you to flush that toilet. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end, we have where it's 43 cents. Again, like Tyler had specified, that's only like a, fl that's just the flow rate cost. You know, what's flowing through, not, you know, personnel, not um, Just you know, out of facilities. curiosity, what percentage of what we pump ends up at the wastewater treatment plant? What, what's, the, what's the line loss there between, in other words, what gets dumped on the ground and doesn't go back in the, Sewer system. Well, I what know. I mean, later we'll see a slide where we're, we we talk about the same numbers for outdoor irrigation, but for outdoor irrigation, we only obviously consider the potable treated water because that is put on your landscape. It is not it's sent through the sewer plant. system. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, in, I can. In, in general, we get about 66% indoor use, 33% outdoor mm -hmm. use is, is a rough number. We have about 33% of our use is outdoor. That, that's the number I was looking for. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're good on this one, huh?
<laughs> All right. So then on to the irrigated lawn to Yscape. We're just showing you how interested we yeah, are. I love I like it. it. I love it. And I'm making notes so I can have, uh, you know, add those uh, questions to my next time I see you guys. So here we have the irrigated lawn to Yscape rebate details for, um, again, just a quick recap. It's $150 rebate to our water customers that have an irrigated lawn that they take out 300 square feet of that or more and replace it with a water efficient landscape or what we call a Yscape. And um, as you can see, one household at the bottom, it's if one household took out 1,200 square feet, um, that would save 9,300 gallons of um, water annually for that one household. So one household can make a big difference. Um, Tyler and I were talking about a bigger picture. Well, yeah, I think sometimes like you see numbers like that. One of the big battles with any conservation thing is what does my little piece really do? You know, is it, is, it, is it really worth it for me to turn my lights off and turn the tap off and all those little things that we each do because it's hard to imagine everything in combination. But, you know, if you just look, we have roughly 6,000 customers. If, if, if each person just did 150 square feet that they quit irrigating, if each, if each property, so 6,000, you're looking at over 55 million gallons annually. That's, that's compounding, and so it, it really can add up to be some big numbers. And as you can also see that there's a significant reduction in water use just by looking at how much is required if you were to water every week. With a Yscape you don't, but with a traditional lawn you would. Um, you know, at the Yscape application rate is much, much smaller than our traditional lawn. Okay, so here is a look at the citywide success of the program. There's a lot to look at here. So quickly, you'll see the participation rate did increase. Again, we're comparing fiscal years. Um, these are this is a pretty fair comparison. As in, you know, an irrigation season usually is May through October, and that's when people are out doing their wisecaping or mowing their lawns. Um, as you can see, our participation rate increased. Um, we do have 28 pending rebates. So that means I have gone out or um, somebody's gone out and done a pre-site inspection. So we have their application on file. We've done the pre-site inspection, give, gave them the okay to give us a call when they're all done. So um, we'll be following up on those um, in the spring next year. Um, and you can also see that um, the converted amount of square foot feet taken out did reduce from fiscal year 2016. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because we have more people involved. And I found in talking with all these wisecapers that their biggest inspiration was that their neighbor did it. So yes, perhaps the neighbor, you know, somebody didn't take out as much as, you know, the year before, but we have more people doing it. And well, so what we found really encouraging is with the initial batch that we got, they were doing a lot more square footage, but a lot of it, these were people that were kind of chomping at the bit and had this idea already. This wasn't new to them. This was just something they were waiting to do anyway, and this just gave them that nudge. So we were really encouraged to see that we had more people participate this year, and we even have, we, and we have 28 in the hopper. So, so we're up to 14 that actually got partic that participated in 28 in the hopper. And so the real encouraging part is these aren't necessarily the people who are just avid wisecapers before we ever even talked to them. These are people who, what we're hearing is that they saw their neighbors do it and they saw someone else do it. And so they're coming in. So it's really, the, it's our target audience because as, as with anything, you have your very interested people that you don't have to sell on anything. And then you have your people that are never going to do anything, no way, no how. But the vast majority of people fall somewhere in the middle in there. And that's really the, the audience that we're reaching that we're really excited about. Being one of the mm -hmm. 28 that's pending right now, I wish that <laughs> the actual work of converting to the Xeriscape is as easy as the, or was as easy as the application itself. <laughs> it was great to have you all come over and look at my yard ahead of time. <laughs> I wish you would have brought a shovel. <laughs> um, Nicole, do you all do before and after photographs? Yes, mm -hmm. I do. And tell me again, the minimum square footage? 300 square feet is your minimum. Is your minimum to apply? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So we have the same numbers um, listed. The total cost for both fiscal years is $3,400. And we have the cost per thousand gallons saved is $1.46 with that comprehensive cost comparison. So this is considering the savings of um, the water production side. And that's at $1.10. And then, again, I list what we had, what I had brought to council with the water conservation plan as far as estimates. Now, um, with this particular program, that varies quite a bit as far as the cost per thousand gallons because it is a direct correlation with how many square feet are taken out. So, 
So there we are with that. And we are happy to announce that the Wyscape Guidebook is available to our residents and our customers. And it's available at the Water Department's online. City of Moscow is also um, handing these out. And I have extra copies here today City if anybody Pullman. needs one. Yeah, but it's, uh, the city of Pullman. Oh, city of Pullman. We were really excited. It, it was it <laughs> was a wonderful cooperative effort. We it's it's been really great this last year. We've really broken some new ground in our cooperation with the city of Pullman in these efforts. You know, we're all pulling from the same well, and so it's it's been wonderful to have these cooperative efforts. And they were very excited about being included in this, and and worked great with us to get this out. So we're really excited about it. All right, so City Hall. This is, I'm going to wrap up this with our successes with City Hall. Um, everybody uh, is aware of that conversion. So when we set up the City Hall Wyscape, it was, uh, we intentionally set it up so that we could very closely track the inputs to the City Hall Wyscape. And what we wanted to do was, was really provide a good apples to apples comparison. And so it wasn't just the water inputs. We wanted to look at the labor inputs. We wanted to look at the greenhouse gas emissions generated by having to run lawn mowers or, or having to apply fertilizers and, and take all of those things into account, take a good comprehensive look at one versus the other. And so we've got some information now. We've got good solid data and that's what we're going to be running through real quickly with you here um, so that we can, we can take a look and not just talk in abstract terms about this but look at a real life situation where we have a side by side apples to apples comparison. And, and that's what we've got here. And, so we'll run through some of the numbers that we've come across in our initial look at what we've done there. Okay, so we were talking about reduced resources and the big one for water conservation is water use. And as you can see, these are actual numbers taken from the City Hall um, Wyscape. There's a separate meter. Um, we also have one at the Water Department that we've been tracking since 2009. Um, so this is good data, and this is showing that we used, now this is for 14, a little over 1,400 square feet, and for both seasons, um, that, that meter is, or excuse me, that irrigation system's turned off now for the City Hall Wyscape. So this, um, we've used a total of 10,600 gallons for that City Hall Wyscape. Now that same amount, that same size, that 1,400 square feet for a uh, irrigated lawn that's efficiently irrigated. I add that because most lawns are not efficiently irrigated. So in the sense that it's efficiently irrigated, that would be over 41,000 gallons for those two seasons. And, and, you, and something I'd like to point out here is that we, we didn't anticipate this good a result. We, we honestly thought that we would, ha usually, you know, with the Wyscape, it takes some time to establish, and we thought that the water use would be less but probably f more comparable with traditional lawn at this point in the maturation of the Wyscape. Mm -hmm. And so we've really been pleasantly surprised at how much the Wyscape has outperformed the traditional turf even in the first couple of years. Does the Wyscape ever reach a point where you do not have to water it in Moscow? If you talk to the people at the Arboretum where there was the original Wyscape that, that was installed over there, they don't water it. They say that they've gotten to the point where they do not apply water to the Wyscape. Our, our, our um, water department Wyscape, we continue to water mm -hmm. at, at a really low rate. Um, I think a lot of it depends on plant selection. I, it, yeah, I it very much better. depends on your microclimates, your plant selection. Um, part of the reason for watering at the water department is we have those, you know, the overhang eaves. It, that, those plants do not receive any natural precipitation. So simply based on that microclimate, I always will have to give them some water. And even at that, it's like maybe once a month. So it's pretty low. Um, City Hall, I did choose the plants to be very um, water drought tolerant or water resistant, or, you know, excuse me, drought resistant. resistant, yeah. Um, however, it's City Hall, so we do have a weather station out there uh, with the irrigation system. So I imagine it will use water, but very subtle mm -hmm. amounts. Yeah, so we, we anticipate this number even getting lower, and that the lawn number is never going to go down. Like, that's continual. It's, that's always where it'll be. It's easy to tell when a lawn's getting dry. Can you tell when Wisecape is getting dry? You can. If you know what you're looking for, I guess. Yes, there's certain plants that I consider like my indicator plants that, uh, like for instance, echinacea is very, um, very much a wisecape plant, but it tends to look a little droopy when it wants See, some water. See, it's hanging out. You, need, you know it needs a drink. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I will say that for the most part, they have long, deep taproot systems. You're planting shrubs; they can find water, so it's not, um, it's not too. It's not too much. Like already, we went from 6,300 gallons to 4,300 gallons from 
you know, the establishment year to our second year. Yes, yeah, so we're already seeing great progress. And then the other thing we wanted to point out, and this was the thing that we decided we wanted to track, not just water, is you'll see here the difference in in the um, pounds of CO2. The, um, it's, it's pretty significant. I mean, we're talking a tiny little piece here. We're talking 1,400 square feet. And, and you see a big difference. And so you can imagine if we start to think about this on a more global scale and think about and, – and the argument that we're making isn't that we don't want grass anywhere. That's, that's, that's not the point. I mean, obviously, grass has its place, certainly within the community and even within landscapes. But, but what we're saying is that we have to be more prudent and more judicious with where we use it. And, you know, I, I guess I'm sure there are people who have an aesthetic preference for – the flat green grass, um, but I certainly prefer aesthetically the Yscape. To me, I, I like the colors, I like the variation, I like the the wildlife. To to me, it it kind of seems like okay, regardless of my preference, there's one that I can afford better than I can for, and afford the other. And so it's like, well, I may have two cars and I may really like both of them, but I got to look at my budget and see which one I can actually pay for. And and the Yscape is more within our price range based so, on the resources that so we have. So Tyler with the city's emphasis on livescape and water conservation and all of that, why would we have any grass around City Hall? And I know what you said about some people need and want grass. That's okay. I get it. Your, your kid can't play in that on the right. He can go and roll in the grass on the left if he wants to. But around City Hall. I, I think that for a long time there was a perception that, that City Hall is a traditional place and it should look traditional, and, and traditional look is flat green grass. But I, that shifted. You know, I, we've We've had broad support from not only administration but our parks department has been they've been wonderful partners through this process obviously they have to look at things with a little bit of hesitancy because they know how to maintain grass they, they, they've had to do that there's there's a knowledge about that and so when there's something new it's like okay we're already strapped we don't have enough time as it is what is this going to cost me and can i do it um but they've been great i, I mean kudos to to Dwight and Dave and, and uh, Calvin and their crews. They've, they've been wonderful to work with. And so I think that there's a little bit of that. But we do see this, Walter, from our perspective, as the first phase in this process. We, we already have um, been instructed by admin to include a Yscape with the eventual bike shelter that's slated to go out in the next section to the uh, east here, the east lawn, which is basically this that right one, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is slated to receive the next phase of Yscape treatment. We accommodated for that when we installed the current Yscape. We put a pipe underneath the sidewalk there and bore that through so that we can continue to expand this. We really hope to use this as the example to expand to a lot of areas of city property where it makes more sense to be more responsible fiscally, economically, and ecologically. In urban areas, people get concerned with um, asphalt and and um, how the the temperature goes up in urban areas. And I was just curious if one of have you considered tracking temperature of traditional lawn versus Yscape? microclimate because if indeed the Yscape keeps the urban area at a lower temperature that reflects everything else in terms of using air conditioning and things like that and mm -hmm. just kind of was curious if you, you know as far as tracking um, that's a very good idea I do consider that looking at a site I consider microclimates because you do have more radiant heat from a sidewalk versus you know uh, an area that just has you know bark or something. I do know that talking with Yscapers, they said, you know, they'll say, I purposely put these plants here because it cools off my house. So you can do those things and I know they work. And I know that a lot of people are concerned with if a lot of people put a lot of rock in, then we might have an increase of temperature. So I know that conversation exists and it's out there and it's worth I think it's worth some more time and in looking into that, yes. Because I can't remember, there is not any rock really in your Yscape on the city. It's mostly bark, right? There's, yeah, the, yeah. The, the ground cover is mostly bark. bark. We do have, you know, some basalt installations and we have some brick just to add some variety, yeah. but th that's more decorative, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's, but yeah, the ground cover is primarily bark. Yeah, well, I just, just begin to think about that because I do see people Yscaping and then they Yscape with the rock because it doesn't sink into the ground. Mm -hmm. is, or it sinks into the ground more easily than the rock, and then the rock creates that temperature mm -hmm. variance. So anyway, it's just a thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wondering if you like tracking things. So, you know. yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, Nicole especially loves yeah. numbers. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So this next this next slide, what it shows is uh, 
just kind of the extension of what we've talked about, uh, the Parks Department, again, wonderful partners that worked with us and tracked the hours that they were spending otherwise on the grass sections of City Hall. And you can see here the, the real stark thing, obviously the cost, there's not a ton of cost because City Hall is a small lawn, but when you extrapolate that number out across, you know, large lawns, and over a period of time, I mean, if this is if this is my household and I've only got a 1,400 square foot lawn, you know, the cost is is significant in that we just don't see the cost for fertilizer or herbicide. You're not having to go buy those things, but you look at the labor, and the labor is pretty huge. Um, the the labor for the Wyscape versus the labor for City Hall, I think that's often an upfront concern, just because anything we're unfamiliar with, we don't know what it's going to entail. But you know, the Wyscape is really, really not that labor intensive. You know, initially in the first year, we anticipated more weeds than we saw. Um, we, we really didn't get a ton of weeds come up, but you do a little weeding, you do some cleanup in the spring, you do some winterizing in the fall, and otherwise you're just kind of keeping a few leaves off of it and keeping the weeds out of it and trash out of it. It's, it's just really not very maintenance intensive. Gina. Didn't you tell me it's about a three year it's about, I would say, in going out and talking with other, you know, with the Wyscape Award, I've had that luxury of talking with those people that have already done it. And that was one question when I was starting this process back in 2008 that I asked, because people do care. You know, they don't want to spend their whole time in their yard necessarily. Some do, but a lot don't. And it was pretty much across the board by year three. Um, that's another reason why I like the bark. I don't like to use the landscape fabric I, because I like the plants to um, send out, you know, spread. And where you have the plants you want, you're not going to have weeds. You know, when you can keep adding bark and that can keep the weeds down. With There's different ways that you can prep the ground to reduce your weed load that first year. Um, so there, these are different things that I've learned over the years, and I will add that a lot of the Wisecapers I've talked to, they said, we like to travel, and we like our Wisecape because we can leave. Yeah. We're not stuck here taking care of our, our landscape. And when I will say when I'm working at City Hall, I really like it because people walk by and they, they compliment it. I have yet to have any bad bad you know comments at all about city hall and they even say oh your wisecape looks beautiful so yeah. th it's working it people are talking about it well, with with growing concern about the use of of fertilizers and and then just you know the the cost these these are actual costs tracked by our parks department or actual labor hours that so this isn't something we're guessing at this these are the hours that that they put into the same amount of grass but Tyler, you would have if you go back you would have additional bark cost on that top line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over time, over time we would add that. Because bark looks really great for two weeks and it goes downhill yeah. from there. Well, we've, yeah. the, we, haven't, we haven't replaced any nope, bark since we put this down, so it's okay. two years going on the City Hall bark that's out there now. And also uh, one of the design approaches you can have is that you do have plants that spread. So again, where you have a plant, you're not having to put bark. Like at the water department, that is so full uh, you know, adding bark really isn't no necessary. Way, no way really to add bark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If that's the yeah. look you like. Some yeah. people like a more open space look, and then, of course, you would have more of a bark cost there. Um, there's benefits beyond just um, resource savings and cost. You know, I love at the water department, we get, you know, visitors of, you know, we get birds. These are, these quill are from at the Wyscape at the water department. We have pollinators. That's a big thing. You know, with our pollinators in trouble. So if you have a variety, you have year-round color, you have diversity, um, there's always something to look at, and it always looks good. And um, finally, uh, back to what Gina had mentioned, it is simple. <laughs> <laughs> so so really that's, that's, that's what we wanted to come and bring to you today is just show you what we've had going on and how exciting the numbers are we have coming back. And so we really look forward to continuing to promote um, we're coming up with more, more and more creative ideas to do outreach for our conservation plan and to continue to expand our wisecaping program both within the city and within the community. And, and we really hope to continue to see the great impact that we're seeing. And so with that, we'd stand for any questions you might have. Is this going before council? Why not? Um, it's, a great, it's a great way to market this to the public. Absolutely. I've, I've, all of us get compliments or comments about saw you on city council on TV. I've never had anybody tell me they saw me on city committee, council committee <laughs> on TV. 
<laughs> well, maybe we've, they do. Certainly, we typically but, start our reports with committee, and if they want to go on to council, absolutely, I would, that would be a choice. Jim, I'd suggest that it goes before the council, find a light night when we can let them and do it do it in the vein of marketing. Mm -hmm. We'd be more than happy report, to do it if that's the council's desire. And not talking to the council as much as to the television set. It, it seems like Nicole does a, a presentation about this every yeah. year, um, did. or did last year anyway, Yeah. Um, about what went on. We do soon. also have the Yscape Awards coming up next month, I believe. Yeah. Some, yeah I think, yeah. think my timeline is somewhere. Yeah. Soon. The next month or so. So that might provide another opportunity to talk about this I as well. I think that'd be a good one. That'd be a, we could mm -hmm. do that all in one night. Little, kind of, yeah. Yep. Yscape, perhaps. Okay. So and tying this in, yeah. um, the water reuse from the clean end of the uh, wastewater treatment plant, what, what's in the works to uh, use, reuse more water in terms of irrigation? For, for instance, we could do the Joseph Street ball fields with water from the there, reuse water. We, we've taken a pretty extensive look, less, less than I met, um, oh, it's been a couple years ago, and really took a hard look at what costs would be, what existing infrastructure exists, and where we could get. You know, obviously the thing you have to try and balance out is is the infrastructure it would take to get something somewhere. So, so you know, to get from our plant, obviously, to the Joe Street ball fields is a long way, a lot of pipe and a lot of pumps and electricity and everything else that you have to use to get there. It's not to say that it's not doable, but we do have, for example, when we did the last phase of the sewer trunk line project, we included, we put in a pipe anticipating tying Gormley Park into the reuse system, which would be the first city facility tied in the reuse system. And we had multiple conversations with the University of Idaho because we would tie through their system, develop an agreement to tie through their system. They have a project that they're hoping to get done in the next couple of years that will bring their infrastructure close enough that we can then tie that pipe in and bring Gormley Park on to our reuse system. And so we've looked at where the potential is that we can do that in a, in a cost-effective way. Um, but that is something that we, we actively pursue as well. David Hall had his hand up. David, um, come up and join the discussion, if you would. David Hall, 1334 Wallen Road, Moscow. Just have a couple of quick questions. I'm sorry my throat's a little bit dry, but I just stuck my knee onto some chewing sorry, gum on the carpet here. Um, I blame Catherine. <laughs> Apparently, I was kidding about that. Apparently, it was true. Huh? It was true. <laughs> That's true. All right. You know what you do to one of your students? Whatever. Now people are wishing they'd watch this meeting, Walter. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been chewing gum. It's getting more entertaining by the minute. Here. Call me up and. Yeah, somebody said they wanted the downtown more appealing. I think we've had enough appeals down there. <laughs> Um, for the lawn rebate, I was wondering what limits there are. Is it one, like one per property, or one for property yes. owner? Or? It's, one per, it's one per household per lifetime. Yeah. Per lifetime. Per Meaning, I'm only household. doing one in my lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if you move, and that house needs it. Okay. You know, so it, there is. Okay. The, I haven't run into that. Um, that question yet as far as if somebody moves and that did that household already have it but um if there's irrigated lawn it it's certainly worth qualifying yes and i, and I think that f as remembering that that this program will continue to evolve this isn't a stagnant stagnant thing right. it'll be a living document you know as, as we get to the point where we have funds what we want to see is as much irrigated landscape converted as possible and so I know I know for example the city of Pullman has a five-year rotation where after five years a property is eligible again so somebody can oh. reapply after five years and that may be something we consider as we get into then into that point of the program because really it's it's not like we're saying oh you got your 150 leave us alone it's like no if you want to convert more you know we, we we're just not to the point where we're running into that yet yeah correct okay <clears throat> the second one I wrote down and you've touched on it since I wrote it but you might Want to expand? Have you looked at incorporating uh, wisecaping into the upcoming parks? Um, I was just at the Parks and Rec presentation. They have like maybe eight more parks on their list. So that's yeah, that's something that we've had. The, our environmental services group has had, had initial conversations with our parks department, and as I said, they've they've been really great partners. It's kind of a new thing for them, but we're it's something that we're very interested in continuing to work with the parks department and cooperating with them to identify what areas could be wisecaped, what areas need the grass, and, and obviously we have, you know, especially in our parks areas that do. And one of the nice things about 
if, if we set up our system right, the parks can become that green space that can then allow other people to mm -hmm. escape. You know, I, I don't I don't need the the space when I realize that I can walk two blocks to throw the ball with my kid, and maybe not everybody needs that space in their lawn, and some people mm -hmm. may choose it. But so that's something that we do want to look at. But there are areas in parks um, where it's it's not a commonly used space for laying out a picnic blanket or something else that that could be converted. And that's something. Yeah, that's a conversation that we'll continue to have with the parks department. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you, Dave. Follow up, if I may, one, yeah. uh, on David's first question. Nicole, back when you presented the toilet rebate program the first time. Yes. This is a memory test. Okay. I, can, I can't remember my exact question, but it was something like what he was asking about how many. Yes. We were, we, and again, that the living document conversation. Um, was brought up and since that time we've had a few other households that have had three instead of the two and so they've been able to qualify for that so we had a li two limit to start two with. for a single been, family that may have been my question why are you stopping it two? and, and, and we're not toilets? we're not yeah. so okay. if they have three and I've had a few come in right. so um, yeah yeah okay super it's a great program it's just a great program. We're I'm excited. so proud of it. And I didn't do anything. I just think it's great. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for Thank you your both support. very much for your presentation. Great. A lot was learned. That's the last item on our agenda today, so I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yeah. We stand adjourned. See you next Monday.